What is up, Prackies? It's Liam Elysiums here. It's been a long time between drinks, but here we are with a brand new episode of Ask Pracky Anything. And to make up for that absence, we have a very special guest with us for this episode. We actually have a head of department of humanities in one of Brisbane's largest GPS schools come in and answer your real world questions that we didn't get time to get to in Pracky Symposium. We run through so many different topics and I think you'll find it really valuable. And that's coming up right now. I just want to remind you that you can connect with Pracky and send us a question for the next episode of Ask Pracky Anything. The easiest way to do this would be to drop a comment down below in the YouTube comments section, but you can connect Pracky in multiple ways. Send us a DM on Instagram, Facebook, send us a tweet on Twitter, and we can drop your question in for the next episode of Ask Pracky Anything. Also, I just want to take a moment to say that it'd be fantastic to see some support for beginning teachers and pre-service and early career teachers in Australia by growing the Pracky community. So if you have a moment, it'd mean the world to us if you could subscribe to us on YouTube and check us out on all our other social media platforms as well. But without further ado, let's get to the questions. What's up, Prackies? It's Liam Elysiums here for a brand new episode of Ask Pracky Anything. We have a very special guest uh, this episode, and it's my dad, Peter Elysiums. He's a teacher as well, um, a school leader. Um, so his experience has really taught me a lot. And I think we, what we're going to be doing this episode, Peter, is that we're going to be answering questions that we didn't get to in the symposium. Sure. You've seen the symposiums? You came to the second one, didn't you? Yes. Exactly. So we have so many questions on the online forum. We're actually able to keep those post Good. event as mm-hmm. well, but obviously we're not, we don't have time to get to them all the time. So there's a long list of questions from actual beginning teachers in Brisbane that we never get time to get yep. to. Okay. So it'd be fantastic to hear your experience and your views on these questions um, coming up for the beginning mm. teachers watching at home. So the first question for you basically is who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Your father, apparently. Yeah. Well, I've been a teacher now for too many years, 34 years, I think now. And uh, I've taught in three states. Started off in South Australia, then went to Victoria, um, back to South Australia, then up to Queensland, and always in the private system. But I went to a public high school as a student. So I've taught in co ed schools and single sex schools, uh, all boys schools. And um, I've taught many subjects. I've taught History, geography, economics, legal studies, e-commerce, science, um, Eskimo literature, I think as well. So I've done a whole range of different things. What's your current position? I'm the head of humanities now, it's called. So what's your day-to-day job description, I suppose? What's your day, or normal day? Well, it's life? middle management, so um, you get classes still. So you've got your everyday classes, which I see as my core business still. And uh, then, of course, my role is to be a team leader and to try to provide support to my team um, with the resources and moral support as well and relaying to them um, what the executives asked us to implement as middle managers. Uh, also to organise things like the text and uh, deal with academic, even sometimes behavioural issues from the students. Um, today I saw a student who was inquiring about changing subjects from biology to geography and um, the big thing at the moment, of course, is uh, unit writing and implementing the new QCE, which has been a fairly arduous slog mm. in a way. So you've got course design, assessment design, and uh, that's all at the same time as you've got other administrative. Mm. So you mentioned that you've taught well, basically all over the country from one tip to the other, and that you've had different experiences um, in different types of school contexts. Mm. One question here that we got sent through for the forum for one of our symposiums was about um, a lot talked about when we go out trying to find jobs about finding the right school for you yep. and that school culture is very important. Mm. You've taught in a lot of different schools from the most private private school <laughs> to alternative schooling, mm. um, co-ed, single sex. What, can, what advice can you give to a young teacher about how that actually happens? Because... I honestly don't know what the perfect culture is for me. Yeah, unfortunately you probably have to jump into the frying pan to see whether 
no, it's, mm. it's the right fit and it's just through trial and error. But you'll soon find out or know whether it's the right fit for you for a school. And for a young teacher who hasn't got much experience to base their feelings on, sometimes when you're struggling, you think sometimes, gee, this is all about myself, that mm. somehow I'm inadequate and mm. perhaps I shouldn't be a teacher, maybe I should do something else. That might account for such the big dropout rate from brand new teachers, staying teachers. So my advice to teachers would be to, based on my own experience, um, to move about a bit and uh, don't stagnate in a school. Um, schools are dynamic places and they do change within themselves. Um, you found that out yourself when you went to the yeah, same school yeah. and did a practicum two times and two different, no, at two different times at the same Black school. Yeah, so sometimes it's a matter of just hanging in there and, and schools change and, and, and you evolve with the changes. But um, I think you find out pretty quickly whether the school's the right fit for you. And um, I had that experience where I've been in a couple of schools where I really questioned myself about whether um, teaching is actually something I should persevere with. And then I went to another school and uh, things gelled and, and I got promotions and, and came ahead of a department. Uh, but another school, um, they sort of made you feel like you couldn't teach out of a wet paper bag. So I went from sort of uh, mm. chocolate to boiled lollies back to chocolate again. So you do have this sort of, sort of um, peaks and troughs. It's like life, isn't it? You don't, you know, nothing's, everything's, no, it's not all smooth sailing. So my advice to, to prac teachers is try to get your foot in the door somewhere. Obviously, if um, there's a, a school where you think you mightn't be the right fit and mightn't be the right place to actually apply to go to, so don't go, go for anything. So for example, if um, you're not particularly religious and, and there's a school that's a Pentecostalist school that has daily you know, liturgy and chapel, and, chapel yeah. and things like that, and that mightn't be the right fit. Um, so. No, look at where you think you might be a good fit, but um, I wouldn't just bar yourself from from trying different schools, and you never know until you get there. When you were, it was teachers' college <laughs> would have been for you, wouldn't it? When no, I went to, I did uh, a lot of people in in my era either they went to teachers' colleges, which was probably the better way of going about if you want to become a teacher who they studied basically education units, or my pathway where I did an ordinary degree, which I did a bachelor of arts where I did um, history and geography basically as two majors and then did a diploma of education after I did my honours year in history. Okay, so when you were doing your DIPED, was that right, DIPED? Yeah, it's like called Diploma of Education after, after the honours, yeah. Um, after your honours year, when you were going out, did what you thought you wanted from a school was actually different to reality once you got there? Did your want to um, change over time? Yeah, I had a bit of a funny start because I um, did a practical at... Uh, a high school when I was doing my diploma of education. It was very similar to the high school that I went to school at and uh, I just gelled. I loved it. I got a really good review and uh, I really enjoyed the kids and I thought that's where I wanted to be. But unfortunately, when I was coming out of university, um, teaching jobs in South Australia were at a minimum. So I got into the private system and the first school I went to was based on AS Neil Summerhill and it was an alternative school. Mm. and uh, that wasn't quite the right fit for me. So um, then I went to Geelong College, which was um, a private co-ed school, Presbyterian school, and it was a school perhaps that was quite different to what I'd ever experienced, being quite an um, upmarket private school. But I really enjoyed it, and ever since then I've been in private schools. But I've been in some private schools where I felt a bit too old school tight, and, and mm. I was um, only too happy to, to leave them. Um, but uh, I've been at Brisbane Boys College now for this is my th Going on to my thirteenth year, and, and I'm enjoyed it. It's uh, it's uh, it's got sometimes things that I don't totally always agree with, but uh, but uh, I found my niche and, and I enjoy it. Yeah. So you would give the advice to chop and change and see an experiment, jump around. Yeah, there are there are some people in the private system who sort of high five each other when they've been in the one place for about 30, 40 years. I don't know if that's the right thing to do. I I, I learned a lot from. Going from state to state and from different systems, you no, know, you, you, know, you get thrown into your own resources and you find out different things about yourself and learn different things from different schools. Um, so I think it's probably wise when you're young to uh, maybe give yourself uh, several years to five years in one place and then maybe go somewhere else to um, progress. Mm. I think from what I've seen personally, the the old message of no, you have that job and you stay there for a minimum of 10 years and you dare not change. I think that's changing mm. a lot and that the modern 
thing for young teachers, it's, it's more acceptable to change around and that's almost saying that you have the confidence within yourself to address that that wasn't the right school for you and that kind of Yeah, if better. I was doing it all over again, I'd probably even think about teaching overseas, you know, yeah. going on exchange or going to the countries where they've got a reputation of doing well. So I think a stint in Singapore in one of those international schools would be fascinating. Um, if you could go to Europe or North America or the UK, I think that would be a great experience for teachers. Mm. Yeah. So you were talking about your beginning years and something and how things change, something that hasn't changed is marking. And even <laughs> today you were mm. marking some history tests and you're <laughs> deep in the sake, um, shaking your head about, you know, some of the student results and beginning teachers often talk about the workload. In fact, I was um, answering a, a question on the Prackies Online um, Facebook group today. Um, a teacher, beginning teacher, is really struggling in terms of the workload that she has. Mm. And that she said that she couldn't help but compare herself to the other teachers that seem to be doing it a lot easier. It does get easier, believe me, folks, because when you first start off, you spend so much time preparing lessons. You can't imagine how you can get your day's work done and, and do all your marking at the same time. But once you get those bank of resources and you get a few tricks in your, in your kit bag, it does get a little bit easier in terms of prep time. Um, now, you, you know you've got that good PowerPoint, that good resource or that good worksheet, and you know it up here as well, so you can almost wing it sometimes, and there's sometimes even your better lessons, and that sort of gives you that time to sort of pay attention to your marking rather than just always doing prep. What but I do remember yeah. when I was starting off, you'd spend an inordinate amount of time preparing every lesson, and uh, more often than not, though, the, the preparation that you did was probably suitable for four or five lessons yeah. but um, that did take a lot of time um, so it is a bit of a balancing act and one thing I would say to teachers there's no point burning yourself out though because you've got to you'd be no good to anyone if you get burned out so you need to look after yourself as well and have that work-life balance which is a big demand for teachers because we could be working 24 7 all year you know there's 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 nothing stopping you from working and improving resources and and researching and, and rewriting units to, for time infinitum. So sometimes you just got to say, no, nah, that's it. I'm going to do something else now and become a person outside of school as well. Do you have any teacher hacks or advice or ways that you purposely try and get away from the profession just to refresh or little things that happen? Yeah, to something that totally, you know, pursue some interest, something that's totally different from what you teach and, and, and something that's just fun just for you. Like for me, it's like... Um, watching some useless things like K-drama, you know. That it's, it's, there's nothing to, to, to redeem it or, to, or to, to defend about it, but it's just pure escapism and bubblegum. And, and, and when you're watching that, it's so silly, but it, it just you don't even think about school stuff. And, and that you need to find some sort of activity, whether it's surfing, walking the dog, or origami, or, or taekwondo, or doing up your car and going for a drive. You need to do something just than just swatting away doing a schoolwork. Um, not that you go outside and, you know, and do you know, great benders and, and, and come back to school bleary-eyed, but you know what I mean? It's, you you got to do something to refresh and rejuvenate. Uh, a lot of questions for us come about things outside the classroom, but we also get a lot of questions about in-classroom things and pedagogy. One question that keeps coming up, and I wonder this as well, is... As a teacher, sometimes you feel like you're spinning a million plates or 30 plates and each plate's one of the students. And that if you have maybe one student that really only excels with one-on-one -on -one, uh, efforts as a teacher, that I know sometimes on my prep, my teacher went, oh, Johnny needs extra help on his own. So you go and help him. But what happens when you turn your back on the other 20? Yeah. How do you... Um, how do you look after the individual needs of a student that probably needs it while also keeping the engagement of the rest of the class? That's that's the golden question, isn't it? It's a real conundrum, but um, to be honest with you, I think if you go out there thinking that you're going to make a difference and be a one-to-one -one teacher to every one of your 28 kids in the classroom, you'll go nuts. It, it just can't be done. So what I suggest you do is just be passionate, be enthusiastic, be well-prepared, um, don't pitch too low, don't pitch too high, have some extension tasks, 
but try to engage the students and hook them in as, as much as you can by your own enthusiasm and uh, have some mixture of activities and go around the classroom as they're working and, and, and see if they need any assistance and uh, get homework in quite often and then you can find out from there from diagnostic things about whether kids need some extra help. And it's not always the sit down one to one whilst you're dealing with little Johnny and the rest of the class are going crazy bananas. Now what you could be doing would be um, getting their homework books in and writing quite a bit of feedback in their homework books rather than um, taking yourself out of the classroom situation. So I think the idea of always having to engage a student one to one in a classroom face to face uh, is a bit unrealistic. I think you can sort of give feedback and help through a myriad of ways. Um, my kids are increasingly emailing me too about tips and help and you can email. So uh, there's just more than one way. Um, seeing them after school, um, if they need extra help, that sort of thing. But don't always think that has to be within the class time. I think that's probably group time and then you can arrange some other times for that one-to-one. -one. Because I think you, you've hit the nail on the head because if you spend too much time um, just spending time with one student in the class, um, what are the rest of the kids doing? Yeah. I know in the Gonski reviews and uh, a push in alternative or progressive education is about individualised learning and making sure mm. that kids can come up with what they want to learn and pursue it in their own time. As a teacher at a large mainstream school, a private school that's probably, I would just, would you agree that private schools probably move slower? Uh, in some ways, um, but yeah, I, I, they're probably more traditional than some. Um, so, but the kids you, have got access to yeah. probably some facilities and technology a lot of other schools don't. This next question I asked Peter because the conversation got towards individualised learning. Now, I'm sure a lot of you see at university with the Gonski Report and new movements within the education sector that this push for individualised student-focused learning has become bigger and bigger. Basically, back in the day, the teacher was the font of all knowledge and that they were the, the be-all and end-all within the classroom. But there has been studies shown that students become actually more engaged with the content when, we, when they can dictate when they learn, what they learn and when. It was interesting to see Peter's uh, views on this topic because it is very divisive within the teaching community. Some say that it is where teaching is going, others say that it's unrealistic. Now I'm kind of torn in the middle so I'd be interested to see what you think of Peter's comments in this video. Is individualised learning realistic? No, no. Um, I think that's the biggest crock of this century, actually, that you can have an individual learning program for each child. It's just, it's just impractical. It, first, you've got to find the evidence that's of validity as well. You know how you're going to base your assessment on, on their learning profile. That's something you need to build up on your own specialist subject, I think, and how you engage with the student. And it could be different in terms of your relationship with that student compared to that student in another class. Um, so I'm not a big one with, for getting student profiles from other classes and subjects and past reports and saying, oh, this is this little boy, He's he's got these strengths and these weaknesses, oh, he's got D here and there, and then go into the class with that sort of mindset. I'd much rather just go into class, give all the kids a clean sheet, and then do your own things with them. And then you'll find that you'll get some surprises and you can get your own profiles working and uh, get to know them better that way without prejudging them as well. But I think the idea of actually having an individualised, differentiated program for each different student and getting to know all their own individual learning styles and sort of catering for everyone, you'd be going nuts. It's just too much. I think you can do that by having a range of different activities and mixing it up within your learning program throughout a topic. And there'll be sometimes that there'll be some kids who, who won't enjoy that particular task or find it difficult that you might need to assist. But you don't then have to have an alternative task in that one particular aim to cater for this particular kid who learns in this particular way for that one task. I think what you can do is you can have a range of tasks within the whole topic. So I think for it's, I don't think it's good advice to say to, to teachers that they should go out there and know each one of their students individually and then to know all their learning strengths and weaknesses. I think ultimately that'd be a great thing and you get there but don't think you have to do that within a few weeks and have to cater for each one of those learning styles in every lesson. I think you'd go nuts. I think it'd be far better to spend that energy mixing it up and trying to come up with some engaging lessons. When I was at school, I really benefited from, I can remember specifically there was a modern history assignment where the topic was Vietnam mm. and that was it. 
Yeah. And your assignment was to pick a uh, yeah, specific I think that, topic, do you think? Within I mean, Vietnam and then... We do that still Jews. today. We still do that same assignment today. And we do, and I know that my teachers and my team do that now, even with the new QCE where we give an element of choice so the kids get some ownership and they can choose some topics that they enjoy. Do you think that's a more enjoy. way of getting student individualised learning? Yeah, because at the end of the day, um, when it comes to assessment, they do get locked into the QCE. And that, I know that in some schools there's more applied subjects and there's greater flexibility. But at the end of the day, they do get a fairly prescribed program where there's specific assessment items with specific assessment objectives. And you can't waiver. It's the extent whereby the QCAA giving advice to teachers saying, oh, you can't put those italics there and you can't bold that. It's got to be <laughs> this font size. So we're fooling ourselves to think that we can cater for every student and what they need. But what you do is you have an assignment whereby you give them an element of choice, but they still are restricted in terms of the way they can actually present the information, which is a bit of a bugbear of mine because I'd like it to be a little bit more open. I think that uh, the big thing we've lost in, in the time that I've taught is autonomy, that I think that we're getting more and more control from the board and, and, and what we, the terms of content, terms of the assessment and uh, yeah, and I, I think that um, schools and, and teachers have lost that a little bit. So that flexibility has, has really gone to a degree. So there it is, Peter's comments there on individualized learning. Now, I'm kind of stuck in the middle with this one personally. Now, I think individualized learning and student-centered learning has its place and it can really work. I mean, when I was at school, I remember I mentioned it in the interview, I had an assignment where the, the base topic was Vietnam, but we could actually choose anything within that topic to talk about with for a presentation. So instead of just making some rote knowledge regurgitation about the Vietnam War, I actually talked about like Woodstock and um, anti-war music movements and the big bands that kind of like Creedence Clearwater Revival or John Lennon. It was really fantastic and got me, that was actually one of my favorite subjects for that term. Now, I do agree that under the current main mainstream model of education, that creating individualized lesson plans for every single student in your class may be a bit unrealistic, but I do think that student-centered learning approaches have its place, but it has to come from the top. I think having this current model and then trying to instigate it right at the bottom isn't the way to go. I think if we wanted to make students the focus of their learning, that we have to hit it from the top and question how we actually frame classrooms and the workload that we put under teachers to make that possible for the students. I'd be interested to see your thoughts. So if you have any passionate opinions about individualized learning or what the roles of teachers currently are within schools, drop them down in the comments and I'll reply to them and let's see if we can get a conversation going about individualized learning approaches. It's um, interesting that you bring up that because I remember we all, uh, you'd have them as well, those fantastic teachers that you remember from when you were at school that probably made you want to join the profession. Mm. I can still think of Mr. Tim Sheshan or Charlie. Yeah, mine was um, this fellow who was a Irish communist who always wore black and looked like Charles Manson. <laughs> but he, and yeah, it, was, yeah. it was never there at school on Wednesdays because it was at midweek racing, but he was a great teacher yeah. because, and I, don't, I dare say he didn't follow a curriculum plan. He often used to introduce, particularly in English, lessons from the latest book that was engaging him. Um, yeah, and he'd, when he taught modern history, there'd be one particular book that he was reading about, let's say, the losses of the French during World War One, rather than looking at uh, sort of the British-Australian yeah. angle, and he'd be looking at it through the French eyes. And, and he's really, really engaged us in that way, because he, he, was, he was obviously enthusiastic about what he was sort of reading and, and researching himself. So, but uh, I think that flexibility, that ability for teachers to do that, it's been lost a little bit because mm. you, he, you, these days you know within four weeks you've got instrument assessment number three and it's got to be a data investigation report and the kids have got to do A, B, C in this particular style and every assessment item that's set is almost the same throughout the whole state. And there's a lot of scaffolding too, so teachers aren't free to basically teach what they want or to set the assessment they want as well. It's all really tight but that's pretty good for starting off teachers because there's a lot of resources curriculum outlines and help online now from the qcaa we of, portal we get a lot of questions about that because i think beginning teachers want to be that 
yet they're afraid that with the new national curriculum, I'm or, afraid. The standardisation. <laughs> I'm afraid, and all the teachers they'll, because they'll get into a classroom yeah. and they won't be able to do that, and they, there's more. Um, C to C, more standardised kind of. Uh, well, it's all kind of more standardised, and and we all have to ensure that we get the kids over the line, and we're sort of all learning at the moment. So, should be getting teachers be scared of that, or or not join the profession? Oh, that? not no. I think it's too too much to say they shouldn't join the profession, but I think they should go there, their eyes wide open, saying that um, they might get some new responsibilities where they go to, but. The thing that they should feel comforted by is that there's a lot of help out there. Though, to be fair to the QCAA, um, they invite people to ring in and email, and there's subject offices, and and also there's tons of resources online. So there's there's a lot of support there. That they have exemplary units and course designs and exemplary assessment items. So there's a lot of help these days that wasn't available when I first started off because we've got the internet now, which you never had when I started off. And we used to have to use foxes and carrier pigeons when I was <laughs> starting off. Now the topic of teacher autonomy came up in this interview and it's a divisive one as you can see from Peter's comments. It also came up from Pracky Symposium 3. We got questions about teacher autonomy and it's something that we're getting more and more often. And I'm wondering why that is. And one reason that I briefly brought up in this interview was that I think we all joined the teaching profession for intrinsic reasons. And by that, I mean that you probably all have uh, that one teacher that you can remember remember from your school days that motivated you to becoming a teacher. I can remember mine. I was disenfranchised with mainstream schooling. I went to an alternative school and I had this amazing teacher that could show me that teaching didn't just have to be what I'd seen previously. But I think young teachers worry that under this new standardized curriculum and with high stakes testing culture becoming higher and higher, that we may not be able to be those teachers that we wanted to be that made that differences for us in the classroom and that we may have all these you know um dead poet society kind of ideas about what teaching may be but under the new c to c and standardized curriculum that we may just be given resources without any personal flair and just basically asked to regurgitate it like a robot so it was interesting to hear peter's points of view about this and it's quite a relief to see that there's a positive spin on it that there can actually be a support network for beginning teachers. But I'd love to hear from teachers actually boots on the ground in classrooms right here, right now. And I'd like to ask this question about whether you feel you do have autonomy in the classroom. Can you change your classroom to the needs of your students and make professional decisions as they arise or not? So I'd love to hear your opinion. So drop a comment down below or DM Pracky and I think this is a, a real passion topic for beginning teachers. So I'd like to really hit it strong. So we talked briefly about students maybe going away from the teacher as the front of all knowledge and going off and doing their own thing. One question is the opposite about students that cling on to the teacher's instruction too much. The phrase we got through the question forum is learned helplessness. How do you ensure that your students learn maybe resilience or that they can be self-responsible for their own learning? How do you push those ideas? Gee, that's a, that's a, I think if we all knew the answer to that one, we'd all be high-fiving and doing a lap of honour. Um, that's, that's a hard one because, as I said, um, using sort of Adlerian psychology, there's only so much you can do it's like the old adage, you know, you can only draw, you know, lead a horse to water. Um, you can't make them drink it. So going back to my former um, thinking, you have to uh, just make sure that you're as well organised and, and as exuberant and enthusiastic as you can possibly be. Um, set a mixture of tasks and monitor the students as, as closely as, as practicable and uh, do it that way, I think because you'll have some students who will struggle, but there's a whole range of things while they are struggling. Sometimes it's just through them being pretty busy. It could be rugby season. It could be, um, I find that kids these days are pretty busy. There's a lot of distractions and, and they can be just darn lazy as well. So um, I wouldn't always in you know make that something that you re reflect on thinking, well, it's all about me and, and I'm failing here and, and they're not engaged and and they're helpless and, and, and it's my fault. Um, is that you can basically just look after what you can do and, and try to engage them as much as possible. 
we're talking about different types of pedagogy in the classroom. Another um, piece of advice that we get a lot as beginning teachers is to create rapport relationships with yeah. the students, and that's probably the best gateway to student and classroom success. One question that we got through the forum is about finding this line. Because I know some teachers just put up a brick wall and it's real old. It's a really hard one because you get told different mm -hmm. things by different people. And this is where, this is the hardest thing I think for young teachers. Um, one thing they'll count against you is that sometimes you're not much older than the students you're teaching and you've probably got more in common with them than you do with the common room. And a trap is that sometimes you get over familiar with the students because you've got more in common with them, you can relate to them more and what they're into than what you can with your fellow staff members. So that's a trap and that gets easier um, with age and with experience and uh, they realise you're an old fossil. When that comes, that's probably a lot easier for you. But um, in relationship to rapport, the old age is no don't smile before Easter or now that sort of thing. I, I, I don't, I'm not so convinced about that. I think you just have to be firm but fair. I'm not a big one for teachers going in and then staying the whole lessons off like some national socialist rally where they go on about about 40 different rules and, and these are the punishments if you do a this will happen you no know, see this do that and this will happen no cop that i uh, i think that just sets the wrong tone uh, as i said be enthusiastic be exuberant be well planned don't put up with rubbish and and set guidelines um but if you just set those together and, and then there's some obvious ones like you know, respect yourself, the learning of others and the environment and make it a safe and happy uh, learning space, a respectful space. And I think that's probably all the rules that you need. Um, you know, when you start talking about you know, the width of margins and materials and this happens if, if there's one day's late submission, that sort of thing, um, I don't think that's the right message to start off. I think it'd be far better to, to um, be a bit of an Amy Squirrel and bad teachers and go in there being super exuberant saying we're on the good ship of learning and, and this yeah. is what we're going to learn this year and we're going to learn together and, and don't have to make it too corny but it'd be far better that approach than to go in there like Darth Vader and, 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 and put a wall up and, and become someone you're not because I can guarantee you this because it happened to me is that if you try to do that and that's not your natural style the kids will realise that you're a fake because you'll lapse back into your more relaxed liberal way maybe and then the next day you think oh gosh I'll go back to the school discipline system and you're all over the shop and you don't know who you are anymore so that's why I said it's probably good to get a school with a good fit where you can just be yourself mm. and and um, I think humour is a good one no um, <laughs> I'm a bad one for dad jokes and puns but they, they, they like that so if you can have a bit of a joke with them no, you don't share a dirty joke or don't do anything inappropriate, but you share a bit of a joke, a bit of a pun is always good. Being self-depreciating is always good. They love that. Um, stirring them up a little bit, you know, showing a bit of interest in what they like. Getting to know them as people is a good one rather than just a, you know, a chair, a student there just sitting there, student A. So get to know their names as quickly as you can, a little bit about them. That's always a good tip. How so, can you be relatable without while still being professional? Like, how do you, is there, how do you keep those boundaries? Well, you don't get over familiar. You don't, you don't hang out with them. You, you, you um, I, I'm not a big one for being, you know, a kiddies pal as well. So you don't have to hang around the, the quadrangle and, and just mix with the kids all the time and, and sort of get to know them every bit of their life. Um, it's something you can build up on over the year. Uh, so, yeah, don't get over familiar. That that's that's not what I'm saying. But at the same time, don't go in too hard, too fast, and be someone really remote as well. It's a fine balancing act, and it, and it does get easier with experience. You no, know, when you, when you say find out about them, you, you know, it's about the interest. You don't sort of say, oh, what do you do Saturday night, sort of thing. You know. So for someone that's just entering this journey, um, this may be buzzing around in their heads, but they haven't experienced it just yet and they want to, and they're going out and looking for jobs and they're looking out for opportunities to join the teaching profession, how can they stand out as a beginning teacher and as someone that could be really employable? You're a school leader. Um, what do you want to see from a young teacher and how can they make themselves stand out for a potential employer? Um, 
The good question. It, it's pretty hard, isn't it? Because as I said, you've got to have your own life as well, and you, and you don't. It's, you don't need to come across as too much of a try hard as well. Um, I look. I've looked and, and interviewed many a person, and and been on interview panels and looked at applications, and I can say that. I didn't care what school they went to themselves. I didn't care whether they came from private, public schools, country, single sex, co-ed. I don't care. And I don't care about whether they were the captain of the school or the prefect or captain of rugby, none of that. Um, I'd be interested in what they took, they got, what they studied at university. Um, I'd be looking for to see whether they are masters of their profession uh, in terms of if they are an aspiring geographer, let's say, have they gone to the Australian Geography Teachers Association conferences? Do they belong to any professional associations? Um, do their interests somehow link into the environment somehow? You know what I mean? So, so I'll be looking more at the bigger picture. I don't care what they did many years ago. I don't care whether they were the black belt of origami back in primary school or they were the ducks of year seven or, or whatever. I'll be looking at what they've done recently and um, whether I think they're going to be um, knowledgeable about what they're teaching. So, for example, in my subject, which also includes history and philosophy, if I was um, looking for someone to fulfil a role in, let's say, a history position, if their background's mostly economics, English, and history was a minor subject, I probably wouldn't be as interested in employing them. So it's probably a little bit too late. It's what you've actually studied at university and what, and what interests you've shown in those sort of particular topics and then those little add-ons that you could do um, to help you in terms of professional associations um, and some of your interests outside of school which might link in to help with that subject as well. So beginning teachers, I mean, there's some positives but there's also teachers are a bit of a whingy bunch. So there's, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of waffle flying about about the teaching profession. Yeah. Sometimes it can get a bit down and, and a young teacher can go question why they're joining the profession especially you mentioned the teacher drought statistics about beginning teachers in the first five years yeah. of careers just before as we conclude what's the one thing you really want to push out to the young teachers probably watching at home your key message about something that you're really passionate about education that you want to see young teachers grab hold of and move into the future what's important for them to keep in mind I think don't get too caught up with all the educational theories out there and, and know all the latest trends and, and be whiz-bang with those things and name drop. I think find out who you are and what your style is going to be. And I think be masters of your profession. Know what you're going to teach. Um, I'm a bit old school that way. I'd much rather someone know about history if they're being a history teacher than telling me about Carol Dweck's latest book about um her higher order thinking and all these sorts of things. So I'd much rather someone be really engaged and, and excited about what they're going to teach. And obviously it helps with um, learning about how kids learn, um, pedagogical things. Um, but um, I think to, to, to start off with, you just have to show that you're really enthusiastic about what you might be asked to teach. I think that's the thing I'm looking for. Yeah. All right, thanks, Pracky, for tuning in. Remember, if you want to send a question through to Ask Pracky Anything, you can get in contact with Pracky in numerous ways. Hit us up on all our social medias. You can tweet us, send us a direct message on Facebook or Instagram, or even chuck a comment down below on this YouTube video for the chance to your question to be featured in the next one. But in the meantime, thanks, Peter, for spending the time talking to the Pracky. Yeah, hey, I'm going to come across as a windy old but. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing young, I tell you what, the, the young people that we've employed have been the lifeblood, I reckon, of our yeah. department. They, they've, they've got the exuberance and the, and the new ideas and, and I think just because you're young, that doesn't mean you, you can't really shape and, and direct a department going in certain ways because um, I really value our young staff. They, they, they've got a lot of good ideas, they, they are showing a lot of energy and... Um, it's good for people of my generation to, to have you know, this new blood coming through and we need it because um, there's too many of us old dinosaurs out there. So, so don't get put off. We need you.
There we go, Prackies. Thank you so much for rejoining us for this debut reboot episode of Ask Pracky Anything. And I encourage you to stick with us on this journey as we try different types of content. I'm sure you saw our Kmart teacher hack challenge just the other week. We're going to be trying new things, having special guests come in and bringing the education profession to you in front of your eyes. And just a reminder that we can actually ask your questions in the next episode of Ask Pracky Anything. So if there's something buzzing around your mind that's creating anxiety or nerves about your prac or even your early career teaching, let's connect with experienced educators in the classroom right now. So drop us a DM or a comment below with your question for a chance to be featured on the next episode of Ask Pracky Anything.